working on your philosophy and all those other things. Let's go up this ladder now just to illustrate a point. Is it possible to multiply your income by 10? All kids need to hear this. I'm, it's not being taught, I don't think, in the local schools. You have to come to a Jim Rohn seminar to hear this. I never heard it until I was 25. It's possible to multiply your income by 10. If we searched around the Palm Springs area, could we find somebody that makes $50 an hour? And the answer is yes, of course. So it's possible to multiply your income by 10. Could you multiply it by 10 again? That's $500 an hour. If we searched around this area, would we have to search very long until we find someone that makes $500 an hour? No. Everybody agrees. So it's not only possible to multiply your income by 10, it's possible to multiply it by 10 again. Now, would it be possible to multiply it by 10 again? $5,000 an hour. What do you suppose I get paid? It's, it's not open for public disclosure. But I've lectured with, you know, Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell and Henry Kissinger and all the rest. They get paid well. Schwarzkopf gets 65000 for one hour speech. So all you have to do is become a general in the army, win the Gulf War, you get 65000 for a one hour speech. Uh, Bill Clinton gets what? 125000 for a one hour speech. And then this just keeps on going, on up to the stratosphere. Someone earned 36 million last year for one year's work. So that's the ladder. Now, jot this down. To climb this ladder as high as you wish. And you've got to underline the word wish. Because part of your future now is what you wish and what you want. How much property will they let you own in America? As, as much as you want. This is wish-want country. You've dropped into the right place. <laughs> as much as you want, as much as you wish. And not to have any, when you live in a country where you can have as much as you want and as much as you wish, see, that, wouldn't that be puzzling to people outside the country? As much as you wish. To climb this ladder as high as you wish in terms of bringing value to the marketplace and becoming valuable to the marketplace, as high as you wish. Here's all you have to do, and Don and Greg heard it all those years ago, and it's a simple analysis, but it's so true. Here it is, one more time. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. That's the simple philosophy that changed my life forever, starting age 25. If you work hard on your job, you can make a living, which is fine. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune, which is super fine. Everything changed for me when I understood this philosophy. I didn't mind working hard on my job. But things didn't seem to change that much. Then I started working hard on myself to qualify. So let me put it in a philosophical phrase now. This is worth the price of whatever it costs for you to be here today. Here it is. Success is something you attract by becoming an attractive person. Success is not something you pursue. It's something you attract by becoming attractive. Here's what we teach in leadership. To attract attractive people, you must be attractive. And the whole scope of this we call now personal development. You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. If you can multiply your value by three, by five, you can easily multiply your income by three, by five, by ten. But the key to doing it is to work hard on yourself. What is that? Oh, right. 
You can have more than you've got because you can become more than you are. Now, that's why I mentioned this personal development part is learning multiple skills. If it would serve you, multiple languages, okay? Working hard on yourself. You know, people are fun to work with. The, the key sometimes it's not fun to work with is yourself. How come I'm reluctant when I should be excited, right? You just go through this dilemma. The work we do is fairly easy. Mr. Schoff, my first mentor, taught me. You know, the world is mostly full of real nice people. In fact, he said there's only about 11 or 12 real nasty, miserable, horrible people in the whole world. Now, he said they move around a lot. <laughs> so you're bound to find one once in a while. But if you found one, you say, hey, there's only 11 more like you. I can handle that. I mean, there's not a thousand, right? so. but here's the big challenge, working hard on yourself, personality and temperament and mindset, we talked about culture, all the stuff necessary to individually be responsible, be a growing, attractive, powerful, skillful, communicating human being, and the world belongs to you. Now, to get others to do the same, that's part of the challenge. But these multiple skills can help you to do that. Now, jot down these five key ideas that can help us all to take advantage of the 21st century. Here's number one, work on your personal philosophy. Your personal philosophy is like a guidance system. Personal philosophy, a guidance system. Now, the subject of philosophy is a big subject, you know, spiritual philosophy and economic philosophy and social and all the rest. But your personal philosophy now is like a guidance system. Just draw you an arrow. That'll be your guidance system. And your guidance system only does two things. One, helps you to see the dangers over here so you don't build on the sand, even though at the moment it looks attractive. Blue sky, fleecy clouds, why not build on the sand? See, you just have to get smarter and smarter at that, not to do that. Now, your guidance system also helps you to find the opportunities over here. And this is what the drama of life is all about, danger riding side by side with opportunity. Los Angeles, a place for the most extraordinary opportunity probably in the world, side by side with danger. In Los Angeles, when the light turns green, you better not go. Wait two or three seconds for those maniacs, right, that are running the red light. Did you ever blink and say, I can't believe the light is green and there's cars going this way in front of me? That's Los Angeles. If you're a pedestrian and the light turns green, you better not go. If it says walk, you better not walk for a second or two to what? Save your life. Save your life. Okay. Danger and opportunity side by side. Learning to understand one so you can avoid it. How to cash in on the other. Now, jot this down because it's got to be taught early. The guidance system must start early. When a child goes to school, they've got to have a good guidance system working so they can spot the dangers to their health, the dangers to their person, the dangers to their thinking, the dangers to their future. Early, this system has to start. From early training, ideas, information, parents, teachers. And the temptation is always there. When I was a little kid growing up, I saw this cartoon of a little boy with a little devil on one shoulder and a little angel, right, on the other shoulder, both whispering in his ear. The little devil says, go ahead and do it, it'll be okay. A little angel says, no, 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 won't be okay, no, no, no. Yes, yes, go ahead, you can get by with it this time. No, no, no. 
What is that? It's called high drama. This is, this is high drama. Every day of our life, we are tempted. Cross the line, tempted. Run the light, tempted. Sometimes it could be fatal in a moment. Here's a father who loves his family. He's a respected citizen of the community. He's got a thriving business, but he's late for an appointment, and he's pushing it in Los Angeles. And the light turns red, and the voice says, go, you can make it this time. Besides your late, go. And now he's dead. This is not an evil man. This is not a bad man. This is a careless man who in just a moment of thoughtlessness loses his life. So everybody's guidance system has got to be alert and working. Whether it's in business, crossing the line. Whether it's a moral question, ethical question, all the rest. All of us, that's why the great prayer says, lead us around temptation. Help us to manage this dangerous side. And then it just goes on and on. This is part of the great drama. The spoiler and the creator. Over here is what? Evil. And over here is what? Good. Over here is darkness. Here is light. Over here is illness. Over here is what? Health. Over here is death. Over here is what? Life. Here's tyranny. Liberty. Why this drama? Because it's the only way to create a human drama. So make this note. One of the best I have for the day. Here's what it seems like. Opposites are in conflict and we are in the middle. That's the game of life. Whether it's in business, whether it's home, social, marriage, personal, friendship, health, no matter what it is. It's the drama. In your bloodstream, there are red corpuscles to nourish and give life like a mother. And white corpuscles to fight and kill like a father. And you've got to have both. Thank God for white corpuscles that think negative all day. White corpuscles say, just show me some infection, I'll kill it. <laughs> because if I don't kill it, what? It kills you. Somebody's going to get killed today. White corpuscles say, it's up to me to make sure it's not you. So the war is going on. Friendly bacteria and unfriendly bacteria. This is the game. But what if you picked up a book and the first chapter said, everything's fine. Uh, second chapter, uh, everything's fine. Uh, third chapter, hey, everything is just fine. Fourth chapter, everything's fine. Would you finish the book? And the answer is no. What kind of a book is this? <laughs> that is not the book. First chapter, the war is on. Wow, let me read the second chapter and the third chapter. Isn't this the deal? Let me give you the last illustration. Would it be possible to win if you couldn't lose? And the answer is no. This is called winning and losing. What if you put a football under your arm and we all went with you to the nearest football stadium and you, with this football under your arm, crossed the goal line? Would we cheer and call it a touchdown? No. It's not a touchdown until you face the 300 pounders <laughs> that want to smash your face in the turf. And if you can muscle by them and dance past the secondary and then cross the goal line, we'd cheer and call it a touchdown and maybe a championship. But not without the contest. So, it looks like God started this whole thing with the angels. A third of them rebelled, and he threw them out, and that started what we call high drama. And the high drama continues today between the spoiler and the creator.
And all we have to do now is figure out in our business, social, personal, economic, daily life, how to multiply all life systems by two, by three, by five, by 10, by following a few simple guidelines. One is understanding, first of all, philosophy being like the set of the sail on a sailboat. The winds are always blowing, contrary winds and political winds and social winds, and familiar winds and unfamiliar winds, and upside down winds and storms like hit Florida. So the wind is always blowing. But to get to your dreams and the things you want for yourself and for your family and the money and all the rest, you don't have to curse the wind. All you have to do is set a better sail. And that's what sermons are for, lyrics from songs, dialogue with conversation with friends. And that's what classes like this are for, is to help keep setting better sail so that no matter what happens in 205, 2006, 7, 8, 10, you will get so good at setting sail that no matter what winds blow, it still takes you toward your destination. That's called the high drama and the game of life. That's it. Making sure you're not building on sand, making sure your casa grande is built on the rock. It starts with personal philosophy. Now, to develop personal philosophy, and only humans have this remarkable ability, every life form seems to be driven by instinct and the genetic code, except human beings. In the winter, the goose flies south because he's a goose. What else could he do? But not true human beings. Human beings go north, south, east, west, all by choice. Human beings can live one way for five years, tear up that script, live another way for the next five years. You can tear up the old script and design a new one, starting at this convention. And you can change a little, or you can change a lot. Here's what's extraordinary about human beings. Let's say that you're here. Just draw your little star, you're here. And it looks like if you keep going like you're going in five years, you're going to be here. Just without kidding yourself. You know, it looks like if I keep up my present daily activities and all, it looks like I'm going to be here in five years. And you're not happy with this five-year destination. Would it be possible to set a new five-year destination and say, I would much rather be up here in five years than where it looks like I'm going to be in five years? Is it possible to make that design, make these little necessary corrections here, errors and judgment corrected and all that, and start going this way, and wind up here in five years instead of here. Is that possible? And the answer is yes. And it's all a matter of personal choice, right? You can change a little or you can change a lot. You can go with the old script or with the new script, either one. At age 25, I decided to tear up the old script. My mentor said, Mr. Owen, you've been working six years. How are you doing? I said, not very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. That's a pretty simple analysis. <laughs> he said, couldn't we go over the last six years and find out where your errors in judgment were? And couldn't we correct those and invest that correction in the next six years? I said, I guess we could. That's what we did. That's how I went from pennies to fortune. Incredible. Only humans can do this. See, if you were a tree, you'd be stuck. Right? If you used up all the nourishment around you, couldn't move, then you would die. But that's not true. So however little what much you want to change, that's up to you. But see, if there's a class and you don't take it, and a skill and you don't learn it, and a discipline and you don't try it, and if there's a possibility and you don't explore it, then who are we going to blame? Nobody but yourself. This is the land of extraordinary opportunity. So jot this down in case some of you have to leave early. I've got to leave in about 35 minutes uh, to rush away. I wish I didn't have to, but that's the way it is for today. Jot this little phrase down, and it wouldn't hurt to memorize it. I'll give you time to write it down. Here it is. From testimonials and personal experience. From testimonials and personal experience.
we have enough information to conclude that it's possible to design and live an extraordinary life. It's possible to design and live an extraordinary life. Now I'm going to have you repeat that back to me. Let's all say it together. From testimonials and personal experience, we have enough information to conclude that it's possible to design and live an extraordinary life. I'd like to have you remember that for the rest of your life. We are surrounded by testimonials. And all of you wouldn't arrived here if you didn't have sufficient personal experience. That we all should keep concluding it's possible to design and live an extraordinary life. And whether you do it more slowly than someone else, or whether you've, you know, set aside the design for a while and you've been coasting, this would be a good time today during these uh, days of training and teaching to get better at the design and living this extraordinary life. Now, let me give you the rest of my ideas. The first one was personal philosophy. Learning to judge between darkness and light. Then here's the key, to cooperate with the positive side. It's like your health. Just learn to cooperate with the positive side. But what if the body calls for a banana and the guy sends it a Budweiser? Good health calls for a banana. Now, if you sent the wrong material, couldn't the body now say, whose side are you on? Good health says, I'm working overtime trying to keep you healthy and push illness into the strong corner. I need some cooperation. And that's what the game of life is all about, to find out where the dangers are, minimize those, push them into a small corner, for a long time in the world, there was more tyranny than liberty. Now that the walls came down in Germany, there's now a lot more liberty than tyranny, along with all of the difficulties and stresses and terrorism and all the rest. Nothing new there. But this is a time of more liberty than tyranny, more light than darkness, more health than illness, more opportunity than danger. These are extraordinary times. If there was ever a time to quickly learn, put it all in order, and move forward on all life systems to multiply their values by two, three, five, ten, this would be the time to do it. Now here's four more key ideas. One is personal philosophy. Here's the next one, attitude. How we feel plays such a major part in our future. First, it's what we know so we can make wise decisions about danger and opportunity. But second is how we feel. First, it's how you feel about the past. You need a healthy attitude about the past so that you use it, not live in it, but use it. Not carry it like a burden, but let the wise lessons you learned from the past now serve as fuel to furnish the future. Next a good attitude about the future. You've got to set your goals. We look back for experience, but we look forward for inspiration. We must be instructed and inspired. No better inspiration than to set your goals. I started this process when I was 25. Literally rocked my world, changed my life. I had no idea it was so simple. Here's how simple it is. Decide what you want, write it all down. Make a list of the people you want to meet. Make a list of the books you want to read. Make a list of the classes you want to take. Make a list of the skills you want to learn. Make a list of the cities you want to visit. Make a list of the investments you want to have. Just make these lists. 
Here's the next key now. Start checking them off. Put a lot of little things on your, some list so you can start checking off something right away. That's part of the fun. Here's what's next. If you check off something major, celebrate. Because that inspires you to make a longer list of goals. And put everything on your list. Little things, insignificant to someone else, important to you. I put a little revenge on my first list. <laughs> my mentor said it was healthy. Some of the people who said I couldn't succeed, kid from the farms of Idaho, they went on my list. <laughs> couldn't wait to get my new car, drive it up on their lawn. <laughs> Say, oh, pardon me, here's the money to have it fixed. Just little satisfactions. My Japanese friend, Toro Ikeda, San Jose, California, put on his first list, a Caucasian gardener. <laughs> yeah, I like that, so. Way back then, everybody had a Japanese gardener. Everybody, Japanese gardener. He said, I'm Japanese, I'm gonna have a Caucasian gardener. <laughs> okay, little satisfactions, right? Set your goals, decide what you want, write it down, start checking them off, it's powerful stuff. Next, it's how you feel about everybody. If you want to be a leader, true leader, entrepreneur of the highest order, well-respected, unique in your field, here's number one, how you feel about everybody. And this is philosophical as well. You cannot succeed by yourself. So a unique sense of appreciation of everybody goes with the territory of leadership. It takes every body for each of us to be successful. One person doesn't make an economy. One person doesn't make a symphony orchestra. It takes every body. For this gathering today, all of you had to be here to make this gathering. Everybody. If one of you were missing, there wouldn't be this many people here. Everybody to make something work for the office, whatever. The enterprise takes everybody. The gift of America is everybody who came over the last two, three hundred years, bringing with them their gifts. No country has become such a depository of the gifts of the world like America has over the last two, three hundred years. People coming, bringing their gifts. Gift of language, gift of learning, gift of politics, gift of government, Gift of medicine, gift of healing, gift of music, gift of the work ethic. All this came in steady streams from all over the world, making us unusual because of the gifts that were brought. And to understand that and appreciate it now gives you open access to the market that's available to make your fortune. Now what I love to do is go back where these gifts came from. Not long ago, I was in Rome, had a thousand people in my class. Someone suggested, Jim Rohn loves the music of Andrea Bocelli, the blind opera singer from Italy. So when they introduced me, I walked to the podium and all 1,000 of these Italians stood up and sang for me one of Andrea Bocelli's songs. In true Italian style, here's. I described it to my uh, grandchildren later. I said, here was the scene. A choir of a thousand and an audience of one. And that was me. I thought, here's where some of these gifts came from. The gift of poetry. The gifts. So learn to appreciate the gifts. Now the last attitude is how you feel about yourself. Nothing more powerful than self-esteem, which creates self-confidence. The greatest steps towards success come from self-confidence. And that comes from self-esteem, doing what you know you should so that at the end of the day, you have high, high self-esteem. That's attitude. Now here's the third of the five ideas. One was personal philosophy, second was attitude, number three, activity. The activity now is the work part, the labor part. The old formula says six days of labor, one day of rest. Don't rest too long. The weeds take the garden. 
But here's what else to remember about the six days of labor. They are miracle working days. That's how you turn nothing into something. You cannot speak it into something. You know, some are trying affirmations, but that's silly. I do believe in affirmations as long as you affirm the truth. The truth. If you're broke, best thing to affirm is, I am broke. <laughs> you put that up on the refrigerator. It's called life-changing. If that doesn't do it, put this up there. Uh, I live in America, and I'm broke. <laughs> Something is wrong. I've been to college, and I'm broke. Something is wrong. See, that? if you affirm the truth now, those affirmations are good, because it's the truth that sets you free. Someone says, every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. What if that's not true? Make this note. Affirmation without discipline is the beginning of delusion. It's not called six days of affirmation. It's called six days of what? Work. Labor. But why embrace the work? Why embrace the work? It is because the work builds the city. The work conquers disease. The work builds an office. The work builds a career. The working on good health builds good health. It's the work that builds a relationship. The miracle piece of turning nothing into something is the work. So embrace and look forward to the work that changes nothing into something. Ideas and faith into reality. Wisdom and faith, uninvested in activity, serves no purpose. But wisdom and faith invested in action, activity, creates cities creates careers, creates fortunes, creates all good and marvelous things that humans can enjoy. The activity, the work, embrace the work. I must come here to be of some value to all of you and do the work. The work of language, the work of words, ideas put in phrases that can be understood and maybe create some enlightenment from it. So I must come and do the work. But if I do the work, some new stories may come spinning out of this session here today. I hope so. So, six days. Have you got that now? Six days work, one day rest. Don't rest too long. The weeds take the garden. Don't get these numbers mixed up now. Six and one. <laughs> okay. Now, here's the last two. The next one is measure progress. Because if you're going to play the great drama game of life, the key is to keep measuring progress to see how you're doing. How's your health doing? How's your income doing? How are your investments doing? If you're building a house, how is it coming along? You know, what's going on? Measuring progress. That's what we call the name of the game. Here's how we teach it to our children. You must make measurable progress in reasonable time. That's about as simple as you can put it to the kids. You're required to make measurable progress in reasonable time. Now, we must be reasonable with time. You can't say to someone every five minutes, how are you doing now? Five minutes later, how are you doing now? The guy says, I haven't left the building yet. Give me a break. So five minutes to ask for a count or a measure is too soon. Five years is too long, too late. Too many things can go wrong. So, reasonable time. Here's reasonable time. One, at the end of the day. Don't let more than a day go by but what you check and measure some things. Count, measure, take a look at. My mama taught good health. I've been healthy all my life. My papa lived to be 93, never did retire. When he died, his paycheck was waiting for him. Mama was good. Mama said, an apple... A day, not once in a while, apple a day. I've modified it a little, apple juice, apple pie. But <laughs> Mama said apple a day. So at the end of the day, check off. The old prophet said if you're angry, try to solve it before the sun goes down. Don't carry it over for another day. It, tomorrow it might be too heavy to carry. 
a conversation a father should have with his daughter today because the magic is there. If he waits till tomorrow, the magic could be gone. Today, a reasonable time to count how are you doing. You have how many properties now, right? It's been six months. You have how many now? It's been one year. Now you have how many? It's been two years, and now you have how many? How, how many? It's the key. Count. Count. It's the deal. Success is a numbers game. How many years do you want your child to spend in fourth grade? Approximately. <laughs> About what? One. One. One grade, one year. Progress. One grade, one year. And you've got to set up your own measuring system. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. You set it up. Because society doesn't require you not have a heart attack. That you must require of yourself. Society doesn't demand that you build a financial wall around your family. Nothing can get through. That you must demand of yourself. So the government's not there to measure. Society's not there to measure. You must be responsible enough to measure yourself. How are you coming on this financial wall around your family? Nothing can get, room, get through. How are you doing? And whether it's a few pounds to lose or whether it's a financial wall or whether it's a growing office, whatever it is, find some ways to measure so you don't become disillusioned thinking, oh, it looks okay when it really isn't okay. Measure, check. Measure, check. It's the game to play. Now, here's number five. First was personal philosophy. We're affected by what we know. Second is attitude. We're affected by how we feel. I've had this debate with Zig now for 45 years. Should you start with education or motivation? The attitude's the motivation. Philosophy is the education. Zig says motivation first, then education. I say education first, then motivation. It's a good debate. I say, Zig, if a guy's an idiot, you motivate him, now you've got a motivated idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so score one for me. But now Zig's com Zig comes back. Here's what Zig says. Yes, but you have to be motivated to be educated. I say, what? That's very good. That's very good. So our debate continues. But you need both philosophy, guidance system, set sail so that no matter how the wind blows in the next few years, you'll be okay because you've learned to set sail, adjust, learn, study, grow, take notes like you're doing today. It, the hard work of learning is just as hard for you to learn and study today as it is for me to lecture. Both of it's hard work, but it's the work that pays extraordinarily well. Okay, then number... Three was activity. This is the miracle piece, the six-sevenths of your life, six-sevenths engaged in activity that creates career, creates a relationship, creates a city, builds the future, creates wealth, power, influence, all the rest. Activity. Then measuring progress. Don't kid yourself. Don't be deluded into thinking things, oh, it looks okay. You know, the bank's full of money. That may not be the only sign to check. The old prophet said, the vineyard looks good, but make sure you check for the little foxes. The little foxes that can't be seen that are eating on the vines, eating on the vines, spoiling the vines. The little foxes. So that you don't build on sand, build on rock, save the day in the future. Now here's the last one, and it's called lifestyle. Because the essence of life is not a Ferrari or a bank account. It's not a million dollars. Here's the essence of life. Learning to live a good life. <coughs> to design and live an extraordinary life. Let me give you my short list of what I think comprises a good life. Learning to live a good life. Number one, productivity. And it doesn't matter if you're a person of modest means or wealthy. Productivity is the name of the game. 
You must, that's what the biggest share of our life is to produce, to produce. The old prophet said, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. The sleep of a working person is sweet. A producer, a producer, not a drifter. Not the sleep of a goof-off man, no. Not the sleep of a joker, no. The sleep of a producer is sweet. Second, friendship. Friendships that endure. Don, great. We go back, what, 27, 28 years? Long time. Good friends. Friends are those wonderful people who know all about you and still like you, right? Those, those are good friends. Next now is your heritage. Keep that alive because that's what makes America great, the gifts that came from all over the world still in service, still in display, the costumes and the customs and the, the language and the poetry and the literature, all that made America great that came from all over the world, deposited here. Keep that alive and growing. Language, music, customs, fiestas, all the good things that come from your culture, your heritage, that keep America lively unique. There's nothing like it in, in the history of the world. 6,000 years of history. Makes us strong. Makes us powerful. Makes us the envy of the world. Next is your spirituality. Whatever you might believe about spirituality. I've got three words for you to consider. Jot these down. Remember them forever. Number one, study. Whatever your spiritual persuasion, study it. Don't leave it unstudied. Don't leave your spiritual heritage unstudied. So study. Number two, practice. Don't leave your spirituality unpracticed. Whether it's one-on-one -on -one in the marketplace, or synagogue, or church, whatever. Studied, number one. Practiced, number two. Three, taught. Don't leave your spirituality untaught. Pass along what's become valuable and beneficial to you. Pass it along to someone else, especially to your children. That's how we build the strong foundation for the country. Families well taught, well instructed. Next, something my parents taught me that they practiced all their life. Now I practice. Don't miss anything. Don't miss the game, don't miss the concert, don't miss the performance, don't miss the show. Don't miss the conversation. Don't miss the sermon. Don't miss the class. Don't miss anything. Go look, see, learn, try, taste. Let that flavor of life be part of your lifestyle. When my father was 73 years old, after my mother was gone, when my father was 73 years old, before he, or 93 years old, before he died, if you would have called him at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, he wouldn't be home. He's at the concert. He's at church. He's at the rodeo. He's watching the kids play softball every night somewhere. My parents taught it, practiced it. Unbelievable. Don't miss anything. Don't miss the taste, the language. Elton John sings, she lived her life like a candle in the wind, never knowing who to cling to when the rain set in. What if you missed that? See, that wouldn't be good. George Harrison used to sing before he died, if not for you, the winter would hold no spring. Couldn't hear a robin sing. I just wouldn't have a clue if not for you. Wow. Go taste. Go listen. Go enjoy. Now jot this down. There's a genius within all of us that recognizes extraordinary value.
besides Greg and Don and, you know, Tony and a whole long list of others, Mark Hughes, some of my claims to fame, a name maybe you might uh, recognize, Ann Geddes. Does that name ring a bell? Especially for the women? She takes photos of these little babies in different settings, right? That's Ann Geddes. She started attending my seminars like this in Australia 26, 25, 26 years ago. And she says, Jim Rohn's seminars changed my life. She's been to the two-day weekend seminar and all the rest. I got to know uh, Ann and her husband. Now she's really famous and rich. We were celebrating her, uh, her extraordinary visit to New York with a friend of mine. We were in uh, New Zealand. And Anne and her husband and uh, Terry Butler, a friend of mine in Australia, and myself, the four of us, were celebrating Anne's New York success. And Terry found a bottle of Chateau Ikem, one of the finest wines in the world. I know he paid about $600 for it, which was... Uh, New Zealand dollars, probably about $400 maybe, uh, American money. But anyway, nice bottle of wine, $400. For the four of us to share. Now, we, prob we probably, and I'm sure we did hope that no one we knew came by. Uh, <laughs> it's just one of those things, right? Just, because there's only four and there's only one bottle. But anyway, if you would have come by, I'm sure we would have let you taste this wine. And if you would have tasted this wine, uh, here's what I'm sure you would have said. I'll bet this wine costs $400 a bottle. <laughs> That's what you would have said. Something called the genius within would have recognized something extraordinary, even though you're not a wine connoisseur. Something would have told you. That's what poetry's all about. Somebody that puts the words together and you say, wow, that is extraordinary. That is fine. Music, language, conversation, learning to recognize the extraordinary and the fine. So I'm asking you to do that. Go see, go look, go taste, go enjoy. Now, one last thought. And my time of departure has finally arrived, and I have to uh, slip away. I wish I could stay and visit and the rest of the day, but I do have to uh, go. Um, here's the last part. Uh, God says, now I'm an amateur on God, but uh, here's my best shot. God says, if you will plant the seed, I will make the tree. Probably one of the best arrangements ever. What if you had to make the tree? See, that'd keep you up late night trying to figure out, how do you make a tree? God says, no, don't worry about that. I got the tree stuff down. <laughs> but I've always wanted, I, I didn't want to be alone. That's why I created all those angels, even though the big drama occurred. I still like to work, right, with humans that are interested in working together. So let's work together. And I think that's the deal. God says, you plant the seed, I will make the tree. So here's my last bit of language, and it says, we have a chance to participate in the working of miracles. We have a chance to participate in the working of miracles. Part of it is the work of our hands. Part of it is the work of our language. Part of it is the work of a soul that cares. Part of it is the work of a compassionate heart. Doing extraordinary work that affects other people's lives in building enterprise, fortunes, future, communities, church. We do good work. So God bless America in our journey into the future as we do our work to contribute to society, and hopefully it'll all help us to do incredible things as a country to compete among the nations of the world so that America can, can continue to uh, bless the rest of the world.
But uh, thanks to Greg and Don one more time for inviting me uh, for a chance. Next time I see you, my therapy will be complete, and I will be uh, back to 100% physically. And until then, God bless. See you next time. Thank you.